Thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Firstly, and always, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we gather here today, the Dharak people, of the lands that's, that encompass the, uh, the, sorry, of the lands that span 2,000, 2,300 square miles from the mouth of the now colonially known as the Hawkesbury River and running inland as far as Mount Victoria. These lands we now colonially recognise as the areas around Campbelltown, Liverpool, Camden, Penrith and Windsor. I pay my respects, my whaka upper upper, and my love, offer to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to humble myself the law to any First Nations people here today always was, always will be Aboriginal land. My Lord of LA, my name is Minnie Dunn, and my ancestors are from the island simply known as South, otherwise known as Tonga. My ancestral villages are Afuateau, the land of the Thousand Courts, otherwise known as Malapo, as well as the noble village of Kohomutua and the Tord Gardenia otherwise known as Kawonga. I'm also a Plumpton OG, so... <laughs> <laughs> Black town, is it? Thank you all for coming here today to this sold out event. Um, every writer here with me on stage is a writer I have worked with or have come to know through my work as the general manager of Sweatshop Western Sydney Literacy Movement, which is a movement dedicated to empowering Indigenous people and people of colour through reading, writing and critical thinking. You can see that some of our books are on stand on the merch table over there. Um, so you're more than welcome to have a look after the event. Um, but before we hear from the writers, I would also like to wish uh, a Ramadan Kareem to all those celebrating the whole month. So the first reader you'll hear from is Evelyn, which is the beautiful head behind me. <laughs> Evelyn Aruluan is co-editor of Overland as well as a poet, educator and researcher working with Indigenous literatures at the University of Sydney. Her work has won the Nikita Brophy Prize for Young Indigenous Writers, the Overland Judith Wright Poetry Prize and the Wheeler Centre Next Chapter Fellowship. Born, raised and writing in Dharak country and now living in Nam, Evelyn is a, is a Bajalong descendant. And so, Evelyn, take us away. Thank you, um, Hello, thank you for having me here. I would also like to extend Queenie's gorgeous acknowledgement uh, and uh, take this opportunity to remind myself of home, of our country, uh, to the place where I have responsibility, um, to where I have ongoing. Um, connections and the deepest of love, uh, but also to um, pay my respects to Wurundjeri country where I'm currently living and I'm very grateful for the care of the Wurundjeri peoples and the Kulin nation of this country which has kept me safe throughout the last year and a bit. So um, it's important to, as Minnie says, it is important to kind of humble us ourselves with that knowledge. Um, uh, and uh, thank you, welcome and hello to everybody who is gathered here today and also to the other speakers who I admire very deeply. Um, I'm going to read a section of a poem from my book, Drop Bear. Um, a lot of it's about their country, Blacktown, Western Sydney. Um, this piece in particular is about um, a road we all know, um, the end four. So, uh, love and four palms. It's called the Ghost Gun Sequence. There's ghosts in the reserve. There's a rusted windmill and water tank, old concrete feeding trails and burnt out cars that fall with the living, goannas, stray dogs, panthers. <laughs> Every life I have knows this reserve and the liminal scrub that spills through the suburbs, which swallows the correctional complex to the west and edges up to the cattle station on the east. I can tell you how to find them, standing stark between a broken fence and the reoccurring dream of Mama Roo bound and broken away from the hood of my neighbour's car. Take 40 steps back from where she fell and follow the creek that makes, makes its bed now only in reeds and memory. Go at the golden hour when the sun slants sideways and watch their skins so for light 
or pass by on a cold early morning and see them softly silking through scratches of tall grass and bush pea. Watch below for blue tongues and red bellies. Watch above for black kites and golden orb weavers. I'm not worried about you finding all this. I'm worried about how you're going to speak it. I've got to go to town now, but I'll be back tomorrow. There's woven reeds and feathers on the dash, and I only clean out the dirt when I have to. It's about 20 bucks to go north and 10 south, but it'll only cost you the petrol to cut through the cheap seats, the brown and outskirts and housing estates where all my elders live. I take Richmond Road slower and dry when everything comes out for the green. I've seen South Creek swellers plain they're cutting up for lines of neat houses all along this way, but they'll never come for the scrub. They need this scrub to keep the ghosts in. They'll come for the poor long way streets first and close off every path to leave without pain. All these roads meet and end and begin at the open field that once was, always will be, the native institution where Governor Macquarie gathered up the precious children, black and brindle, to teach them God and civilization and to be without your family or your land or your name. It was here that Maria, daughter of Yellowmundi, son of Gomburi, leader of the Borobongo, the place I go monthly to cut lantana and take my shoes off at the feet of ancestors, was taught white man's language and how to scream it back at him. Skipping ahead slightly in that piece. Um, the Cumberland Plains of Blacktown and the Hawkesbury are drenched in a history of settler violence and forgetting that goes unspoken when we squall over heritage. The bridge, the dairy, the statue, competing heirlooms for the pastoral squatocracy now crowded by mid-density suburban sprawl. When Watkin Tench stood at Prospect Hill in 1789, he soliloquised the Miltonic visions of this place he looked upon as a wild abyss. Shortly after, the rich alluvial soils were carved up by a fence and crop and poof and were cartographied into the names of holy lands, Jericho, Mamre, Ebenezer, he was to be known as the breadbasket of the colony, a magic pudding for the settlers to eat and eat and eat. I look over to Prospect Hill as I pass through the M4 roadworks. In the way I know all times are capable of being, Tench's gaze is still there, but so is ours, staring back. to be from Blacktown, which I find really amazing. And so Drop It just came out. And so if you're interested in buying it, it's unfortunately not here today, but I promise you that it's gonna be at the QBD at the Blacktown East Point. And so <laughs> while you're shopping for your Saturday afternoon, I definitely recommend having a look and definitely buying it if you can, because um, it speaks so much to Australian mythology and the myth that Australia, that colonial Australia tells itself. And so thank you so much, everyone. Um, our next reader is the wonderful Mariam Azam. Uh, Mariam is a Pakistani Australian writer and teacher who lives and works in Western Sydney. She graduated with honours in creative writing from Western Sydney University and holds a diploma in the Islamic Study Sciences. Her debut poetry collection, The Hijab Fire, Fires, published by Jiramondo in 2018, was shortlisted for the Mary Gilmore Award at the Ant Ann Elder Award. Um, can we all give Mariam a round of applause and she'll Thank you, Winnie. Um, I'd just like to ask the audience to forgive me for the fog in my throat. I'm fasting, so my, my throat is a bit dry. But I'd like to offer four poems as part of my reading today. Um, these poems are from my collection, The Hijab Files, many of which are set here in Blacktown. And I actually launched my book here at the Blacktown Art Centre in 2018 as well. So I'm very attached to Blacktown. A brief guide to hijab fashion. For an elegant look that won't fall apart during those long hours at school, uni, or work, try a love scarf wrapped once around the head. Pin one end by the ear and bring the other across to conceal the shape of your bust and discreetly fasten onto the shoulder. Note, a 
Adam's now approach or statement had been to jazz up the book. When fine dining or a friend's party calls for some bling, or the hippie in you wants to show off some tribal earrings, tie the scarf at the back of your head, wrap one end across and back over your bun and pin in place. Bring the other end across your chest and secure. Note, a large bun will keep the scarf in place. Use a volumizing scrunchie to boost bun size. In the middle of a Sydney summer, when the seatbelt stings to touch, keep cool in the Kaliji, aka Dubai style. Let the scarf billow as you wrap it loosely around the face, hold in place with a headband. The resulting soft drapes frame the face and fall across the chest like a curtain of cloud. Feel like a desert princess. Note. Engineer even drapes with a few discreet pins. If you'd like to wear a silk square scarf without it slipping off your head the minute you move away from the mirror, may we recommend the Turkish style. Fold it in half, pinned under the chin, wrapped around the neck for definition, and tucked in or fanned out across the chest. Turkish women like to pin any folds down for a sleek, defined profile. Note, suits women with round faces best. For that poolside Bali resort chic, look no further than the turban style. Pull on a ninja cap to cover a bare neck and tuck in the hair. Then twist tie two ends of a rectangular scarf behind your neck, like a bandana before wrapping the pieces over and around the head. Note, to avoid overheating, use a light breathable cotton scarf. For soccer training, quick supermarket trips, or when unexpected guests drop by, go for our no fuss, one piece, ready-made scarves. Available in cool cotton or stretch jersey, plain patterned, ruffled sequined, these scarves simply slip over your head and you're done. No pinning required. Note, perfect for bad scarf days. <laughs> <laughs> the Hobbling Bogan. I was hot and tired in my brown uniform, the white pull-on scarf itchy around my face. I wanted to get home and pull it off, pull my scrunchie off, shake out my hair. There was a long tunnel to Blacktown Station, two flights of stairs and three minutes to make it to my bus. I ran, my heavy school bag banging on my back as I dodged people meandering in thongs. I almost slammed into a hobbling man in an untucked plaid shirt, hair unkempt, carrying a plastic bag and hunched like Quasimodo. I nodded sorry, stepped aside, and kept going. I heard him shout, go and hide behind your effing scarf, as if he was throwing rocks at my fleeing back. And while I was running, I wondered how I was supposed to hide behind a scarf that fits, fits snugly around and not over my face. I ran so fast I managed to catch the 722 and flash my bus pass out of breath, but not so fast as to outrun his words, because they caught up with me on the blue bus seat. I sat and trembled from the running and from the fumes of those words. I carried the stink of them home. Normal people don't say such things, said my father, while my tears dripped onto the carpet. I hadn't even taken off my scarf yet. Ninja. It's been three months since she started wearing the cup. It's made her violet eyes bigger, doubly framed with black eyeliner in the style of an ancient Egyptian frieze. Her voice emanates from her eyes which flicker while she talks, and every now and then her breath ripples the Georgette over her mouth and in the sunlight I can see through the fabric like a fly screen. 
She tells me what it's like. The packy guy at the 7-Eleven scanned her milk and bread, then scanned her down to her head and toes, trying to register the beauty she must be hiding. On the footpaths of Lakemba, bearded men in jubbers that sit above the ankle stare respectfully at the black blotches and spit stains on the ground she sweeps over in her abaya. At Westfield Mount Druitt, a boy in a white snapback snarled ninja under his breath as she walked past. No one saw how she grinned and whispered to herself, hi -ya. <laughs> So the last poem is called We Meet Again and it opens with an epigraph, a saying from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The souls had their rendezvous. Those who liked each other then love here. Those who remained strangers then do not join here. The first time we met was not the first, I swear, by the tumbling of light and dark in your eyes and the crumbling of my thoughts in answer, our memory electrified, except we had forgotten to go to class and felt the piercing of this place, the way that entering into prayer pierces a place. The edges of our meeting were clouded over with the rolling mist of ancient memories so that we could pretend we were standing on shuddering stars and not on star-shaped leaves along the cracked cement path to the campus in Sola. Suddenly, the pin popped out of my hijab, and the significance popped out of the moment, and all seemed lost, except I was able to fix my scarf, so that in the curve of your half-smile, and in the shiver of my arms, and in the looks we exchanged like messages, we remembered. This was an introduction of bodies. The whiteness of your wrist, the perfect sculpture of your teeth, these are burned in my memory. Thank you. It's the first poetry collection that I ever saw that was about Black Chamberlain, about Mount Druitt, which was um, so amazing to me as someone who was 20 when I first met Marion. Um, and it was something I'd never seen before, so it was amazing. Um, the other thing is just um, the, the layers of uh, mystery and in between culture and faith and, and what that means. And I think that's quite beautiful. And so Marion's collection is also for sale on the neat little uh, beautiful display table over there. So definitely give it a go um, and have a read. And I think, you know, as locals from Blacktown, supporting writers from Blacktown is a really important. So on to the next writer. Sarah Malik is a Walkley award-winning journalist and writer who grew up in Western Sydney. Her most recent work, The Area, a three-part SBS series, explored the changing face of the region and experiences of race, culture, class, and immigration through conversations with locals in their favorite cafes and restaurants. Mark Mariano, who was doing the social media today, was also a part of that series. Uh, and he is a Blacktown OG as well, so definitely check out the area by SBS. Sarah is passionate about storytelling and voice, and believes there is power and freedom in women and culturally diverse people taking control of and telling their own stories and narratives. Yes, take it away, Thank you, thanks so much for being here. Um, and thank you, Evelyn and Mariam. Um, just touched my heart so deeply. It's beautiful work. Um, I'm so proud uh, to be in this lineup with these amazing women. So uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, so a change of pace. This is some journalism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to do uh, just a brief excerpt of the natural section of um, uh, the series of articles I did for SBS uh, to start now. 2770 is a famous postcode, one of the most notorious hoods in Sydney. Mount Druitt is also where I live. Yes, shoes disappear from the streets of housing. 
And the top Google search term for the area is, is not good dangerous? <laughs> but there is an energy in these streets, like walking into the local Starbucks, a kind of professional epicenter for the area's freelancers and students. It's car park full of young people breakdancing at sunset to a beat box. Sitting on a train while police dogs sniff annoy teens, the melodies of Polynesian kids singing gospel fill the air. There's the luxury seats of Hoyt Cinemas, inheritor of the 1990s Astro Cinema. You're too young to know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a teen again, roaming. In the absence of anywhere else to go, the air-conditioned shopping centres become the de facto public square. Sydney is a city of boroughs. Certain boroughs receive all the glamour. Sydney's east has its iconic beaches. The cool kids walk to the inner west. Not that cool. Um, <laughs> there's the Bible Belt of the Sutherland Shire. There's the bushland of the north. But the boroughs of Sydney's west remain overlooked. Home to almost half of Sydney's 2.12 million population, the region forms Australia's third largest economy. And with massive developments and a proposed second airport at Tiger Creek, that number is set to grow. But historically, when the area does get attention, it's often for drive-bys and violence. Its reputation hardened as an industrial blot, a vacuum of depressing disadvantage, an awkward geographical footnote to stow away as you ascend into Sydney's hierarchy. But today, what I find is a creative and complicated place, teeming with stories. Third generation bakeries and family owned restaurants, a burgeoning hip hop and art scene, a place where waves of immigrants created a home, a melting pot of food, culture, and even entrepreneurial wealth. Located between Penrith at the foothold of the Blue Mountain and Blacktown, the Mount Druitt district captures the satellite suburbs of Bigwell, Doonside, and Everton. It's urban and flanked by a massive train station nestled, nestled near a Westfield. Named after English major George Druitt, the traditional custodians of the modern day, much of modern day Western Sydney are the indigenous Darug nation. My family lived in a tree-lined suburb nearby, and in their retirement, my parents moved to Mount Druid, attracted by the Pakistani and Polynesian communities crowding the churches and mosques that have emerged there over the past two decades. They have migrant wealth earned after a lifetime of labor, but are too thrifty to live anywhere that doesn't have an Aldi superstore. <laughs> After a decade of living away, I find myself during COVID lockdown casting an eye to the place that has formed me, and I'm seeing it through the eyes of a new generation, proud, fierce, and unapologetic about their roots. But the mention of Mount Druid can spark an almost visceral response in other people. The response is a feeling Adele knows too well. During her first year as a journalism student at Macquarie University in Northwest Sydney, Adele would dread an evening freak icebreakers that forced her to reveal her hometown. She would say there would be a kind of pause, stunned silence, discomfort, and practice recovery. <laughs> when I said I'm from Mount Druid, people would respond with, oh. <laughs> I would cop that so much, she says. Adele tried being vague, telling fellow students she was from greater Western Sydney. <laughs> but at the end of the first year, she just wanted to quit. I just couldn't find the connection I wanted with people. It was made even more painful by the dysphoria growing up as a self-declared harpy with a Somali dad and a Maori mom. Seeking to fit into mainstream Australia, Adele's parents didn't want to impose out of their culture, a decision that left her with the thirst to learn more about her roots. I didn't look or speak Samoan or Samoan. I felt like a fake Samoan. I felt like I couldn't validate how Samoan I was, Adele said. At school, she tried to connect with other Pacific Islander kids, but her saving grace was, ironically, the Palm Pacific supermarket in nearby Everton Shopping Centre. Palm Pacific is owned by Lebanese migrant Norm Saad, who began his life in Australia as a factory worker. Now an owner and CEO, the 68-year-old migrated from Australia in Lebanon as an 18-year-old with his wife back in 1969. Entering the store as a kid, Adele felt home. It was like a Halloween moment entering the Palm Pacific supermarket. The store sells everything from straw mats, coconut oil, skirts, green bananas, fresh taro, even fruit flavored dental products. And cookie time. <laughs> yes. But it was the food that Adele remembered from the Sakusoy noodles, 
corned beef and coconut palasami, and fried panakiki pancakes while in the canteen. The food there was bomb, Adele recalls. The place was always drenched in the memorabilia of the island, with a painted blue color that washed over every inch of the wall, reminding you of the Samoan Sea. I learned so much about Mount Rogers than we can all see why Sarah Malik is an award winning journalist. And I used to get those responses too. I remember I went to like this HSC camp when I was in high school, and there's a bunch of like boys from Beaker, I want to say. Yeah. And the first time I said I'm from Mount Druid, this guy he just stared at me and then he was like, have you ever gotten stabbed? Oh. <laughs> yeah, me. I think everyone has a story of yes. that is fine. Yes. <laughs> that is fine. Um, thank you so much. Uh, our final reader, uh, which I'm really excited to hear from, is Joy Adal. Joy is a Filipino-Australian writer and emerging artist from Western Sydney, a business journalist by day and calligrapher and memoirist by night. Joy uses different mediums to tell stories and surface the colour and connection in our everyday experiences. She is published in Sweatshop Women, Volume 1. Take us away, Joy. So another change of pace. Um, today I'll be uh, reading a shortened version of Quick Fillow, which is my short story that appears in Sweatshop. The front office at St. Patrick's Primary School <laughs> smelled like chicken noodle cup of soup and milk chocolate. Mark pulled the office doors shut behind us and rolled up her umbrella, placing it against the warm leather seat that was across from the reception desk. I sat down, my bottom sliding all the way to the back so that my feet hovered above the floor. Mark stood at the counter, her thick black hair held in place with a litter of mousse and hairspray and her white blazer and navy blue dress, crisp as chips. She looked like a movie star. A lady wearing a green knitted jumper walked into the office. The scent of chicken soup and toast followed her. Be with you in a set of love, she called. I heard hundreds of students making their way outside the big lunch as an old woman with short, curly white hair pulled the office door open. The silver chain around her neck had a large crucifix on the end, and she wore a long grey skirt that looked rough and uncomfortable. She reminded me of Maria from The Sound of Music, <laughs> so I instantly liked her. Hello, she said, sounding like a host from Play School. I like to read them all. She shook Ma's hand. You must be Mrs. Garcia. Ma nodded and paused. Her English was always slow and formal compared to when she spoke loud and hasty to go at her. Sister Agnes, we're so excited to finally visit St. Patrick's. Ma looked at me and I jumped off the chair quickly. This is my youngest, Jerrica. Ma put two hands on my shoulders and ushered me to stand in front of Sister Agnes. It's lovely to meet you, Erica, Sister Agnes said. Bending down, she spoke to me. I frowned. She got my name wrong. Just like this boy, Luke, who was in my year at Shelley Primary. What do you mean your name's Jerrica? That's not even a real name, he yelled in the playground, pointing a pale, jerk crusted finger at me. I bet your name's meant to be Erica, but your parents can't spell it because they don't speak English. They can too understand English. I yelled at him. Then I ran to the girls' toilets, where I hid until lunch was over. That night I went home and told Ma and Pa that I was never speaking to Gawain again because my teacher said I needed to improve my English. I spent an hour in the shower, lathering dove soap all over my arms and legs trying to wash myself wider so no one would tease me again. Ma pinched my shoulders, and I realised that I was still frowning at Sister Agnes. No, I said, trying to catch my breath. It's not Erica, it's Jerrica with a J. Sister Agnes raised her eyebrows at me and then smiled, showing me all her yellow stained teeth. Oh, I'm so sorry, it is lovely to meet you, Jerrica. Ma pulled me back by my shoulders. I wriggled out, out of her grasp. Hating the way her hands held were holding me down. Shh, she hissed at me. Then she said softly to Sister Agnes, I'm so sorry about my daughter. In Sister Agnes' office, the walls were covered in holy pictures, similar to the ones Pa hung up in the living room and bedrooms of the white library house we were renting in Blacktown. Be quiet, 
class ordered me for her tea as I climbed up on the big armchair across from Sister Agnes' desk. I'd embarrassed Ma, but I wasn't sure why. I didn't understand why she'd apologized. Isn't Sister Agnes the one who got it my name wrong? The fabric on my dress was making my neck hot, but I wasn't about to risk an ear flick by scratching or saying anything. I didn't want Ma telling Pa that I was getting fidgety, or worse, Uncle Liv. Good Filipina girls don't complain or nag. I sat on my hands, listening to Ma, as she told Sister Agnes about my older brother, Ben, and how much his grades had improved since he started going to a private Catholic school. Not that Ben's grades were actually ever bad, Ma was just using him to impress Sister Agnes. <sighs> my brother, Ben, never got told off for being a hobbit. Ben was always getting compliments from the other Filipino moms at church for sitting in mass so quietly, for knowing all the mysteries of the rosary, for being so tall for his age and for his smooth skin that was lighter than mine. I looked around to Sister Agnes' office and noticed a wooden plaque on the wall. He had names of students in grades on it in gold. Joseph, Karen, Brian, Sarah. Then for the rest of the meeting, I thought about how Ben got a simple name. As the firstborn and only boy in our family, he inherited our paternal Warbo with Ben's nickname. Me, I got lumped with a combination of my maternal Warbo and Lola's name, Geraldino and Incarnation. <laughs> After the meeting with Sister Agnes, Ma and I walked to the bus stop. She was walking quickly so that we could make the 721, and I was struggling to carry the plastic bag that had my new uniform size inside, which was two sizes too big, so I could grow into it, and so she was in one. You don't speak to Sister Agnes like that, Ma told me, snatching the bag from me, slinging it over her shoulder as we made our way onto the bus. It was rude. Ma paid our fare, and I sat on my hands and felt my face get hot the whole trip. Whatever Ma said, I knew it was Sister Agnes's fault, she was so old, so she was probably deaf. If I didn't speak up, she didn't even know my real name. At this point, me and Ma went straight to Sorry Sorry for the Pino store to buy Tosino for dinner. Hi, Tita, Ma called out, greeting the lady behind the counter in a sing-song voice. I took the lady's hand and held it to my forehead as a request for her blessing. Ma no call, Tita, I said, even though she wasn't an auntie and we weren't related, Ma and I called her Tita as a sign of respect. Similarly, we called older Filipino men Tito, even if they weren't my uncle. It confused me, because it felt like every Filipino was related to us, <laughs> but it was handy when I forgot people's names. God bless you, Anna, Tito whispered in a thick Filipino accent, letting go of my hand and gesturing with her lips to a tray of pachinga that was next to the cash register. You have to, just don't tell anyone. She winked at me and put the orange rice cakes into my hand. I dipped the two pieces of pachinga into a plastic bowl of freshly grated coconut and stuck them quickly into my mouth. Hello, Kumoska Tena, Tita said, as Ma arrived at the counter with a basket full of frozen tocino, longanisa, several chates of sinigang sapalo, and a week's worth of kandisao. Oh, good day, boy. I see you've met my bonso, Jerika. Ma smiled, but her eyes were on me and the kachinta. Tita nodded, her black hair covering her eyes. Yes, yes, Erika was very good, even asked for Mano when she arrived. Ma looked at me with narrow eyes as she got her wallet out, testing me. Thank God for the kachinta. Sister Agnes was one thing, but Mal would kill me if I spoke back to a Tita. <laughs> Thank you so much for those gifts of literature, everyone. Uh, now comes my favourite part, where I'm going to ask these wonderful writers some questions. But I just want to take a moment to really take in the fact that these are all incredible writers from Blacktown, you know, like I, I, I personally went to a private school in high school where they didn't raise the Aboriginal flag, they still did missionary trips to <laughs> convert Aboriginal people to Christianity, uh, which comes with its own historical problems. Um, and I was one out of two Tongan uh, students in uh, a school of about over a thousand, I think, when I first started there. Um, and so I never thought that they could be writing from or about, I never thought they could be writing about Blacktown, let alone writers from Blacktown writing our own stories. So I feel like this is such a significant panel for me, um, a highlight of my career, and it just seems so fitting to have that at Blacktown Arts Center, so thank you so much. So my first question is, and I want to pose it to Evelyn first, uh, what is your connection to Blacktown, and how does Blacktown and its surrounding suburbs influence your writing? 
Um, so I'm just basically saying how amazed I am by all of this beautiful rise. That was gorgeous. Um, thank you to Marianne for reading one of my favourite poems from Huge Out Files and also, you know, thank you to Sarah and Joy because that was just like so good. Um, so my connection to uh, Blacktown is a pretty historic one. Um, my family came down from northern New South Wales, Bundawong, and also around um, Dinawan Reserve near Gaduga, um, around about like at the sort of um, beginning of the 20th century, so over 120 years ago. Um, we don't fully know what brought some members of my family down here. Um, it could have been song lines, it could have been people in reserves and missions such as the Sackville Reserve, um, which is uh, around the Nepean River. Um, and that, you know, due to bad record keeping, that's something that, um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time trying to understand further. But Blacktown has a really strong and powerful Aboriginal community and it has for a very long time and so a lot of my elders um, who have you know given me everything my whole world, Auntie Gloria Matthews and uh, the Matthews family, Uncle Wes um, uh, Uncle uh, Uncle Roy Sims and uh, the now like Auntie Charlotte Mips, um, beautiful strong cultural people who have devoted their lives to supporting Aboriginal children in the Blacktown region, in Hawkesbury region as well. Um, my dad was working alongside these elders um, since like the 70s in different schools, Fairfield High, Biddle High, um, Blacktown Boys and Girls, um, same with my mother. So, um, you know, I feel very much entangled in not just the history of the Blacktown region, but also in this history of social justice and educational equity that a lot of people have been fighting for for a very long time um, and establishing all kinds of networks like the um, Aboriginal Education Consultancy Network. And I've been going to these meetings when I was like itty bitty and sitting in the corner drooling or whatever it is that kids do. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it, it, has, it has had a strong influence on my work, but I think what's really important to emphasise is that it's the work of different organisations and collectives and individuals that are pushing back, we're getting a lot of pushback against migrant writing, against diasporic writing, against marginalised writers talking about their own context and what, what they love and romanticising what they love um, and what they have known, what they've grown up with. Um, there's a lot of criticism out there for marginalised writers writing about, you know, out of some of those experiences and, and just writing them about diasporic aspects of culture and stuff. There's just a lot of shit that gets heaped on, on this generation of writers that are taking up their own space and doing it with authority and agency. So I don't even know if I would have had the confidence to write and romanticise my own, you know, my own sort of community and culture if it had not been for those efforts. So, you know, like a lot of mad love and respect to me for everything that you're doing in this space because I think it's a really active effort. So it does inspire my writing, but it is, it's the, it's the people that have made a space for that that I think is, is um, something that we really should be celebrating and reminding ourselves of, of that active effort. Absolutely. Um, I love that comment about romanticising the area in which you come from. And Sarah Malik, I can't help but have noticed in your writing of that piece in the area. It was a very realistic view, but also a very romantic. But the way you painted Palm Springs, yes. the big shopping, you know, beautiful. And so what's your connection to Blacktown and how does it influence your writing? And, and why such a romantic picture? Look, that's, that's really interesting. And I just... Just everything that Evelyn said, um, I, I feel so much. Um, I left Western Sydney when I was 20, I left home. I was like, I'm going to be a journalist, I'm not going to talk about my identity, I'm going to be a good journalist, I'm going to write good stories, and uh, that's it, you know. Um, um, I wanted to get away from everything, you know. I internalised so much of the conversation other people had about me, I think I did that unconsciously. 
And really, it was coming into my 30s and like what Evelyn said, you know, really seeing the, the shift in um, artists and writers of colour really reclaiming their own stories and where they're coming from and decentering that gaze, which we have all internalised, and um, that kind of puts or posits the status quo as somehow neutral, you know, and, and that, you know, erasing yourself to fit that is somehow the ideal, you know, and so for me coming back last year was an accident. Um, I was in, co I was under COVID, I was stuck at home, so I couldn't go and do any stories anywhere else. And it was really shifting and thinking, actually, there are a lot of stories where I am and where I live. And I had not thought of it as important. I thought, you know, I wanted to go to New York and London and be an, being an artist was being somewhere else, not being where I was, you know? And um, it actually made me realise that that was actually, um, where had that, where had those ideas come from? You know, there was so much to be um, discover about where I grew up and who I was and embracing that and exploring the complexities of that. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, all love and all hate, like it's complex, that, that nuanced relationship, because often you can do internalize the shame about growing up uh, in a place which gets the response, you know? Um, and so for me, um, really doing these stories helped me discover a new generation who was proud and who was unapologetic about where they were from, and who were doing amazing things, like these were hip hop artists who were going to um, France and the UK, and having amazing careers and coming back to their studio in Condor Park, you know? And so it made me realise that um, the region was changing and that um, by, I think, I think everyone talked about the gaze, you know, so much of our writing and our art and our stories have been filtered by the white gaze and by decentering that and looking at our own stories and our own laws through our own gaze, it's like something vital is recaptured in you, you know? It's like, um, doesn't mean you have to stay where you are, but embracing and understanding your roots and how that shapes you, I think, is very important for an artist. And understanding that the stories are all around you and there's nothing too small to be a great story or to be art, given if it's from specific supermarkets. You know? Um, so. mm -hmm. And Joy, what about you? You haven't got the response? But, um, what's new? <laughs> <laughs> you read those slides. I, I grew up in Black Town. My family moved to, uh, from the Philippines to Australia when I was three. And so I came here when I was four and started school here. And, um, and every time I would go to any competition, sporting, debating, through high school, we'd go to the drop up with these, you know, these nice private schools with these girls in their fancy places. And they'd say, oh, where's your school? And I'd say, Blacktown. And they'd go, oh. And then they'd sidle away and have their little posse. And I'd go, like, okay, see ya. And yeah, definitely got the response. And um, also went to Macquarie Uni. And I found it really unsettling, and I think, I definitely internalised a lot of that shame um, yeah. and just, you know, tried to build a career elsewhere, tried to write about other things. And really, and again, to what Evelyn said, it wasn't until I went to a sweatshop workshop and was encouraged to just tell a specific story specifically about where I came from, about where I grew up, an experience I had had, that, you know, that, that was a totally new idea for me. Um, and I'm so glad that we need to, to do that because I wouldn't have that short story if, if not. And I wouldn't really stop to think about all the little experiences that have shaped me, that have shaped my family, um, that are unique to us and that I should be proud of and that I want my kids to be proud of. So, you survived the challenge. <laughs> um, Marianne, as the first writer from Blacktown I've ever met, um, what's your connection and um, how did the surrounding suburbs of Blacktown influence your writing? Well, um, my story is a little different in that my family moved to Blacktown um, when I was 15. Um, I was moving from the Mortdale, Hurstville area. So I would already internalised all of the negativity about this area. And I was incredibly shocked and horrified we were moving here. And I was very embarrassed to tell my friends at school that we moved to Blacktown. Um, I, I went to school um, in the city, to Sydney Girls, and um, students there come from all over Sydney, so many from Western Sydney, but also many from the eastern suburbs, North Shore, all over. So I tried telling a friend, you know, that I'd moved to Blacktown, and she was like, where's Blacktown? <laughs> and so I just came to say, you know, I live near Parramatta. So any, anyone else, I live near Parramatta. <laughs> if anyone was interested to know further, then I'd probably say Blacktown. But yeah, that was that was my 
because um, studying Australian literature at university, I had an interest in looking at how Muslim women, particularly um, Muslim women from Kabul or where hijab or niqab were represented in Australian literature. And while there aren't a great many references to them, where there are references to Muslim women, um, it tends to paint a very stereotypical picture. Um, the woman has no agency, no voice, she's been forced to cover. And really you get the poet's sort of just reflections on this covered woman that he or she has seen and not really knowing much about them. So I really wanted to uh, fill that gap in the landscape of Australian poetry and look at the um, lived experiences of a Muslim woman. And I think to be really authentic, I had to write what I know. And what I know is, you know, being a young woman from that town. And that's sort of how I came to write about this area as well. Beautiful. And so, Evelyn, your debut poetry collection is called Drop There, which I think was created by America as like this killer koala that drops from trees. Um, how does Blacktown and Incense Drop There fit into the myths of colonial Australia? Something that your poetry collection, I think, is the first to really assess that. Yeah, so Blacktown has, and you can probably guess where it goes from the name, um, <laughs> Blacktown has a really quite complex and quite dark history in um, Australian literary and cultural representation as well as in um, as well as in you know just the actual history of massacres, invasion and um, land exploitation. And it's interesting for me to be now kind of looking at that from a place that has a, a short a much shorter colonization history than even you know Blacktown further out in Western Sydney. Um, so it's one of the first sites in Barrack peoples were, um, you know, one of the first peoples to be impacted by the first killings and um, by the first wave of smallpox, um, which a lot of historians, uh, second historians have tried to deny that, you know, white people brought over, but it, it's, I don't know how they think they can win that argument. Um, so Blacktown, the Blacktown region started being started to be carved up and given in land grants to white settlers um, and to um, convicts uh, who finished their sentences around um, very shortly after the first fleet arrived. So around um, as 1791, Blacktown started getting carved up, and it was because it had very rich farming soil, and they worked out that the sandstone of the sort of inner Sydney region wasn't enough for them, wasn't wasn't the right soil for them to be growing these crops that actually ended up being very destructive to our environment. And like there's a lot of so what can teach um, wrote a very kind of biblically infused um, account of his travels um, over to around prospects um, and to you know regions that we now call the Blacktown District, uh, the Cumberland Plains, the Hawkesbury. Um, and it's it's just, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And so like maybe to just talk about one particular thing. Um, you know, we have the first land rights, the first written land rights claim um, at, um, from 1842 from Maria Locke, uh, when she tried to claim back land that had been taken from her family uh, and then given back to her family because her brother Colby um, helped uh, Black to cross the Blue Mountains. And it's, um, this is the first like written letter by an Aboriginal person by their own hand and is asking for their land back. And she asserts herself, I'm an Aboriginal woman from this place. My father was, you know, your equivalent of a, of a king here. Um, this is my home. And I think that, that that's a very strong literary history that we have to emphasise as Aboriginal voices speaking back. And when we ground our understanding of how Blacktown is represented in that knowledge, as opposed to first thinking about what contention and then thinking about the other colonial writings and, um, you know, there's, there's canonical white Australian texts and paintings and representations written about 
the region. Um, but I like to remind people that it was also this the first site of like Aboriginal voices demanding demanding land. Um, so it's really like this melting pot of all the tropes of settler coloniality, the pastoral myths, um, the massacres, many of which are not fully um, acknowledged uh, by White Australia that there were massacres in Black Town. Um, and uh, then we've got new new myths being made by white settlers like Kate Grendel, who wrote The Secret River, which is, I feel, a very disrespectful representation of um, the Hawkesbury River and of the Black Town and Hawks, what's, what we now call the Black Town and Hawkesbury districts. So the settlers keep on myth making, they do. Um, what I tried to do in my book was make some of that apparent, but also I think you have to make fun of it. Like I think what we actually really should do is we should critique through like satire and through silliness at times because it's just so absurd when you just have this like wealth of this huge weight of very serious settler imaginings about land that they just point blank did not understand to the point where they lost several townships from floods and then they just kept on rebuilding them and the river just sort of going around here. Um, so it's just it's just an interesting site of settler complete miscomprehension, invading invaded miscomprehension of the landscape. And then this, you know, really strong, you know, the land confused. The Aboriginal people on this land confused, and we just have to remind ourselves of those stories when we get another, you know, secret river or whatever, whatever else other kind of white colonial imaginary of this region. Yeah, absolutely. My favourite story about Black Town is that a couple of years ago a survey went out to like change the name because it was becoming inappropriate or something, and then everybody in Black Town was like, no. No, 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 we're, we're keeping it. And I think that was so yeah. amazing because it was like, no, the Blacktown residents want to keep that history and they want that history to be yeah. known. Um, yeah, I, I think it's amazing. important that we keep that name as well. Like that, that road, you know, like the town was called Blacktown because of the road that led to the native institution. Like, you know, you don't get to, white people don't get to hide from that history. They made it, you know, we have to remind them of it as much as we can. Absolutely. Um, and so, on that note of history and, and now lived experience, Marion, you were talking a lot about writing poetry um, as a Muslim woman and kind of the white gaze looking at your community and, and looking at um, hijab wearing Muslim women as this mystical, mysterious um, entity. And you know, we've had you know, in the last two years, you know, in the wake of Christchurch and in the wake of um, that horrific, um, I want to say, violent attack that happened in Parramatta, uh, where uh, a woman's hijab was pulled off um, at a cafe. Um, how do you find poetry within your lived experience and with, with that kind of Islamophobia of Australia um, in its kind of everyday? Um, I guess, you know, um, I'm really interested in uh, humanizing Muslim women, I guess you could say, because um, as I mentioned before, when Muslim women are represented um, in literature, there isn't really a lot said about them. Um, they've got no agency voice. You don't get an idea what their day-to-day -day life is like or any of that sort of thing. So really, um, writing the hijab files, I thought about, you know, what are people going to find interesting about the day-to-day -day life of you know, this Muslim character, you know. For example, um, how many, you know, people would know, you know, what it's like to wear a niqab or that, you know, being called a ninja is something that often happens to niqabi women that, you know, that, that some of them just take it really lightly and laugh it off or, you know, um, the fact that spirituality is so much a part of the fabric of the day, having to pray in all kinds of places, like the shopping centre car park, or <coughs> you know, just outside the um, movie theatre and all those kinds of things. Um, so part of me was interested in looking for those moments that people are going to find interesting. Um, so that sort of writing for an audience who's not very familiar with the day-to-day -day life of Muslim women. The other side of that was I wanted to write for Muslim women and for a Muslim audience who can see themselves 
in their mind because growing up as someone who's loved reading, um, you just don't see yourself as a Muslim child or Muslim woman represented in the literature that you read. You know, when I look back at things I used to write as a kid, you know, it would be about Mary and Tom and their adventures and you know, the lives of the characters in the stories I was writing was so different from my actual real life. You know, Mary and Tom don't pray or don't have a parent who wears a hijab or don't say salam or you know what I mean. But because I hadn't seen those things in the literature I'd read, subconsciously I sort of absorbed that these things, you don't write about them. These are not characters that exist in literature. So I, I do want to write for the next generation, an accessible collection where they can enjoy seeing a character like themselves uh, in the work. Beautiful. And um, Joy, I think, I think you were talking on a similar note as Mariam and, and talking about your experience at Sweatshop and being told for the first time to write about Black Town and your own lived experience um, as a Filipino woman. And so Black Town has a very strong Filipino Australian community. Are there enough stories um, about the Filipino Australian community in Australia? Why or why not? Short answer is no. There are not enough stories. Um, I think most people can relate to the fact that if there's an Asian character or a story, we're all lumped into one stereotype. We're all Asians look alike, all our cultures are the same, and they're all kind of meshed together. Um, I, growing up, much like Miriam, you don't see Filipinos in TV shows. Um, what you do see in the media is often a caricature and a stereotype. And yet, Filipinos are born storytellers. I think the first um, impulse I ever had of wanting to write about my experience and my family was because my dad used to sit down and tell us about what life was like growing up in the Philippines. But, and I would write those down, but I would never, never would have thought to share, share them. Uh, it was, and again, it wasn't until I um, you know, came across a group of writers who were very much encouraging us to share those stories and not just keep them to ourselves. And that was the first experience really where I thought, okay, I'll submit this, I'll get this published. But I think part of the reason why there aren't enough of those stories is, one, we don't see ourselves, and so we internalise that idea that our stories aren't worth sharing. Um, secondly, I think there's almost a, a, well, from my experience, certainly, there's a cultural um, discouragement of the arts. And I remember very much wanting to be a writer, but my parents saying, no, I'm going to stay the job. Uh, get their job pays. And you know, now that I've grown up, I understand where that sentiment came from. They came here and had to work really, really hard and they wanted to make sure their kids, you know, also had the stability that they had worked really hard for them to give us. And so I can understand why they were saying, you know, don't take that risk. Um, but I and I do hear that often from, you know, children of, you know, parents who immigrated here not to embrace their creative expression and to go instead and focus on other things. And I, I really hope that me spending time on, the, you know, on art, on writing, uh, encourages not just myself and not just my kids, but the other, the other people who read my work or buy my work, to do that and to, and to look for the stories and to look for their own way of expressing it. Um, there are so many, so many people that I've spoken to, even in the project that I'm working on now, about the language just spoken around Blacktown, once they have that opportunity to share the story, their own experience, like their words or their meals or their favourite foods or the things they do on weekends with their families, their eyes light up. And I, it's just such an empowering thing to shine a spotlight on those simple everyday stories. And so I hope that this generation can change that wave and that we do see more Filipino authors, that we see our names on the spines of books at QBD and, and in Dimex and everywhere else, and that we can start to show the world that we exist not just as a stereotype or not just as a mishmash of Asian <laughs> character, characters, but as a people, as a, as a person, as an individual. Yeah, beautiful. And I think just on that note, people often ask at these panels, what can I do to help? The best way to do that is to go to QBD after this and say, buy these books, 
Buy special women in volume one, volume two, buy the gel files, buy the copies of Drop Day. We want to see them. Same as Mugtown Library. They they sometimes take free requests. I think during COVID there was free requests. Um, there and, always is free requests. There we go. And I used to work with Margaret for when I was in year 10, and I can't wait to talk to her after this because I've missed her uh, for my work experience at Blacktown Library. Um, so yeah. Uh, take, go to the library, make a free request, and that's kind of the best way to help. Um, and it's the best way to say, you know, we're from Blacktown, and we also want to hear Blacktown stories. Um, and so, on that note, Sarah, you kind of sit at a precipice with SBS. On one hand of SBS, there's Struggle Street, <laughs> um, which I grew up in, and it caused me to internalise a lot of shame about Blacktown. But then you've got the area, which is your pride and your joy and your work, and I think your way of responding back to kind of the politics in your own, uh, in SPS's kind of cohort. And so I've always loved that you were kind of the media's voice, I think, for the area, and you're from Mount Druid, and you speak about Mount Druid, and you speak from a really loving, intellectual place. And so how did that happen? And why is it why is it important that media about Western Sydney is documented by people from Western Sydney? Um, I just listen to what everyone's been saying, and I think it's just wanting to amalgamate that. You know, writing is really an exercise of power. I think that's that's really important. Um, it structures things, you know, things like neighbours and you know these cultural icons of Australia. They're so banal, but because we just think about it and read about it and has that prominence, it becomes this iconic defining aspect of Australian culture. And so I think having um, different voices and different stories saying, I exist, it really is um, kind of a, a conveying that you know, I matter, you know, and it changes the way you feel about yourself and it changes the way society responds to you. So speaking and writing and creating art, it changes the contours of the society in which you live in, it changes your world. Um, and like Joy said, it's so empowering to have those kinds of um, uh, pictures of yourself um, that you create for yourself and you're not being defined by others. Um, so I think that this came out of that process, but also being in the media, I guess I didn't just want to write about myself, I wanted to write about everything, you know? And so I think that's really important, decentering the white gaze. Um, I kind of wanted to be a foreign correspondent actually, and you know, white journalists go to Afghanistan for the exotic. I just go to the Northern Beaches for the exotic. <laughs> you know? And so I think that being, there's this power in, in recognizing that, especially um, people who come from um, non Anglo backgrounds, have this very powerful insider outsider status. You know, because they are coming from these contradictions and between worlds, they have this gaze that is very critical and very, um, it's a very powerful gaze, and I think it's a really powerful gaze to look at the world that you're in and see things that other people don't see. Um, and so for me, it's not only just talking about myself and the area, which I've done, but it's a long history, a decade of journalism, and it's where I want to also um, see the world, to see, have, tell stories from my lens and look at everything from my lens. Um, and because so much of the world we see is through one particular lens, which is the white male lens. Um, and so I think that that's really important um, because you know there's things that other people don't see as contradictory or as fascinating or you know almost an anthropological gaze on Australia itself, which I've never fully felt like I've fitted into. And I'm like, what's camping about? <laughs> you know, like, like if I wanted to like sleep on the floor and go on a squat toilet and be eaten by mosquitoes, that's just like childhood trips to Pakistan. Like, why would I do that voluntarily? You know, and it's just like okay. And, Culture is interesting, um, so that's an interesting for me. You know, turning, turning that gaze back, um, and it kind of makes me realize I feel so comfortable here with all these women, and it made me realize how much I haven't felt that comfort, and how much I've struggled in systems which are not designed for me. You know, and I think that that struggle can feel very demoralizing sometimes, but there is a power artistically when you're chafing against things, and I think there's a way of seeing the world and of understanding it and of expressing yourself that can really talk back to the culture and create new truths. That is interesting, <laughs> you know? Like, not only powerful, but just interesting. Um, and not just the banal usual that you see on neighbours, you know? Um, so I hope that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely did. Um, yeah, so talking about culture, Blacktown, yeah, cool, cool, cool. But I want to first and foremost want everyone in this room to recognise that everyone here is writers. 
first and foremost. They studied writing, they studied, they either did a Bachelor of Arts or Media or journal, whatever it is. Writers first and foremost, which I think is always tricky when people see writers that are from backgrounds um, other than the kind of monocultural background that we see on Australian media and television. And so I think recognizing that we're writers first and foremost is important. And so one of my favorite questions that I love asking, and I think Evelyn can really start this off because I feel like she has the most expertise as a co-editor of Overland Journaling, which is also something you should check out. It's a great uh, journal for Australian writers. Um, Evelyn, what makes good writing? Oh no, sorry, there was still time for the audio to go funny. Can you repeat the question? I got to Evelyn, what makes good writing? writing? What makes good writing? Oh, what makes good writing? Okay, um, I, my very direct and easy answer this is sincerity. Um, if you are representing an experience you don't know anything about, like white people love to believe that they just have this exceptional creative imagination that can go beyond any particular <laughs> um, And good on them for the confidence. But um, the imagination and sincerity are like very different things and you can have, you absolutely can have both, but you cannot have good writing without sincerity without like an honesty of the vision you wish to create whether that is a direct representation of something you've experienced whether that's something that you have the deepest of empathy for because you have connections to that you've been witness to that you can't fake sincerity and like if you don't have emotional cultural social political spiritual states in something if it doesn't mean something to you you're never going to be able to write that well. And that, I think, is something that defines this growing movement of writers of colour, writers of culture, diversity, marginalisation, like people who are actively voicing stories that institutions and publishing structures have wanted to conceal. Um, but it, they're not powerful enough to do that because sincerity will always trump whatever other kind of exploitative, appropriative impulse is going on. Always that's what it comes down to for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Marianne, you're also a teacher um, as well as a writer. And so on all levels, I think, in your experience, what makes good writing? Um, so I'd like to veto everything that Evelyn said. And I'd also add um, one of the most important lessons I got out of my um, out of being a part of Sweatshop Writers Group was this idea that good literature makes a contribution to knowledge. Because literature is, is kind of a conversation, so you want to add something to it. And I think um, you know, when I when I looked for that when I saw that gap in literature where there was just not also women's voices heard especially in Australian poetry, that was something that I felt that would be meaningful to write and I could potentially make an original contribution here. Um, the other thing I would add, and I guess this comes as well from my background as a high school English teacher, it's important to me that literature is accessible, that the reader is able to understand, particularly when it comes to poetry because uh, nowadays in the classroom, we mention to the students, we'll be looking at poetry, all you hear is prose. And oftentimes it's because we're looking at poetry that the students simply can't understand or access. Um, so for me, um, especially when we're competing with um, so many other forms of media um, with the next generation, that literature should be accessible. Um, to these students so that they can appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut, I know we probably scheduled question time for 1.30, but I'm definitely gonna cut into it. Um, <laughs> so we'll probably have 15, 10 minutes if that's okay with everyone. So uh, Sarah, as a journalist, what makes good writing? And is there a difference between good writing and journalism and good writing in fiction, for example? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been, I've been listening to what everyone's been saying, and I think um, when you're a writer of color, um, you don't just get to be a writer, you know, you become unconsciously political because just even existing or voicing your story is political. Like what Mariam is doing, you know, she is just writing stories from, you know, uh, 
her experiences and, and, and the culture, but just because it is something that comes against so much in the culture that is uh, violent, it becomes an act of um, defiance, it becomes political. Um, but you might not necessarily want it to be that, you know, and so there's this tension that exists between who you are and how you receive, um, and kind of this, um, uh, you become whether you like it or not political, you know, and um, I think that that is a tension that exists when you are a minority in a sphere that has defined media or writing for a long time, that just, just your inclusion in that, um, and being who you are and saying, that an existing becomes something that's political. And that's a burden that not everybody wants either. You know, like I think about um, sometimes when you're, you know, within the media sphere or within the arts sphere, you also have to become a de facto spokesperson. You have to, you know, start looking at how you know, resolving diversity issues in your organization or your field or, or, you know, that can distract from the kind of writing that you want. And you are also going to be the universal. You know, you don't always want to be defined as the particular. So there's this tension, I think, that exists um, when you're a, a writer of color or a minority. But that, you know, I think um, is is also kind of a gift as well. You know, and I think I think you know other. I think there's a there's a joy and camaraderie that comes with being uh, like I just feel so happy to be next to Marion right now. In a way that. Like she knows, she understands what it means for us to be here, and she understands the context of what we've lived through in Australia in the 2000s. And, um, and can I just add, this is the first time I've been on a panel with someone else of Pakistani. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. And so I think that there's this um, camaraderie that we have as writers and artists that, um, and a joy, and um, knowing uh, each other's experiences that maybe white writers don't have, you know? And so I think to embrace that connection uh, to each other and, and knowing that struggle and what that means and how that gives you a kind of humility um, where you are and, and a feeling of, I never want to do that to anybody else, what was done to me. You know, I want to have that humility when I'm listening to other people's stories from, from different backgrounds and, and honoring that and, and never feeling like I'm going to rush in um, I never wanted to be that journalist that I saw growing up that I felt marginalized by, you know, who would talk over you and speak for you and, and think for you and assume things. And I wanted to come in with, from a place of humility and from allowing people to speak in a way that was authentic for them and framing them in a way that they felt at ease and comfortable with, you know. Um, so, um, and ideally giving them, um, allowing them to be able to say what they want to say about themselves in a way that makes sense. To them, um, so I think that that really changed how I wanted to do the work that I did. Um, uh, just seeing all the stuff that I didn't like, <laughs> if that makes sense, and if that answers your question, <laughs> it does. It does. Yes. It's about it's about seeing what's invisible, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and realizing that it's missing because we're often denied or we're often not taught that our experience is missing. Yeah. Um, which I feel like is quite strange and quite sad because I feel like the hegemony in Australia get to see themselves all the time and they see it as quite normal. Yes. And, and then it comes to a point where they don't even see it anymore because it's just so normalised. Yes. Um, because I think... I think I'm putting it out constantly. Yeah. Because the, the erasure becomes the invisible norm. Yes. yes. But, I, but I also think the hegemony in Australia, like, that's quite monocultural, um, they do have their community and they've had it since colonialism. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so when we start creating our own community, it's like they get a little bit fragile I think sometimes, which is but it's normal to feel that way. Um, but that fragility can sometimes come across as a bit not well meaning, I think. Because yes. um I'm just remind people that there's space for all of them. For everyone. There's space for everyone. Yes. And yes. people rising up with their story and their it's not taking away, away it. yes. to what exists, it's adding to it. And yes. it's always been there, you just have it out of it. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And decentering that power is mm. nothing to be afraid of. You know, like we, the, the, we want to coexist within this sphere. We want to, you know, um, we just want that, that space, that equal space yeah. that we've been given. Um, and so I think what everyone was talking about, you know, that backlash is really, is, is really 
um, just it's saddening, you know, because um, I think um, there's room, you know, yeah, so much room. There's room, yeah, and um, it's time. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> you know, yeah, absolutely, it's time. Um, and so, Joy, I want to ask you the same question because you're quite creative and malleable with words. I mean, one, you're a writer, two, you're a calligraphist, uh, which you can see on the beautiful stand over there, definitely buy some because uh, they're quite beautiful. Um, and you're also a memoirist, and you're also talking to people, recording stories, taking downloads. Um, what makes good writing to you then? Um, the first thing I'll say, and this is something I've learned as a business writer, but I often have to teach colleagues for their writing, is to write how you speak, keep it simple. There's this, we're almost poor when we go to school or university to write with this sense of authority, like you need to write as if you know everything, which is never true. <laughs> and no one knows everything. No one has all that authority. No one should speak with that much authority. You, you should approach whatever you're writing with exactly as you are, and because exactly as you are and your perspective is a completely valid one. And uh, I remind people that writing simply is actually the most accessible writing, it's the most relatable writing, uh, it's the most understandable writing, and probably the most enjoyable writing to read. Um, so that's the first thing, and I think um, capturing all of the, the things that, um, especially in my experience, interviewing people about their, uh, their life and, and writing my own memoirs, my dad's memoirs, um, stories from other people who really liked how is the importance of specificity and being specific and unapologetically so. And that's why I loved, I, I love the sweatshop books because there are so many examples of that in the, in the words that people use, in different languages, in the naming of food, in the naming of, of specific cultural references that I might not know because I'm Filipino Australian, but you might know because you're from a different culture, a different country, and those specific words shouldn't need explaining because it, on text, I think. I think you just need to write them, and then the person who's reading can go and figure it out and can do their own research. Because the walk on Google now says there's like absolutely no reason why you need a glossary or anything in, in the text, but this, being specific and, and naming the things that matter and naming the things that make you who you are, whether it is the dish that you eat. My mum's sitting down, my dad loves kachinka, that's the last case, that's a nice story. You know, the words that, that don't have a literal English translation because English can't possibly capture all of the emotions and the meanings behind those words. Like those things are the treasures that we need in literature. Those things are, and that's why I love to do calligraphy because it allows me to zoom in on you know, specific words and specific phrases. Uh, because those, those things are where the gold is. And often we're taught to write in broad brush strokes and that sense of overarching, you know, being narrow, the gaze. And it's a, false, it's a false concept, really. And so the more specific, the more relatable we are, the more powerful our writing can be. Beautiful. I always love asking guys that question. It's, uh, it, really, it really centers writing in the forefront and how, what, a, what an artistry um, writing is. And so for my last question before we go to question time, we spoke a little bit about Sweatshop here, there, here, there. But as a general manager of Sweatshop, <laughs> people might be wondering in the crowd, what is Sweatshop? And why is there a panel full of women uh, of this? And so my answer to that question is that I'm the editor of Sweatshop Women Volume 1 and 2, which is Australia's first um, anthology not only written by, but edited and designed by women of colour. Um, so there's 22 writers um, in each anthology, so I think, if my maths is correct, that's 44 writers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that, that's just where my own kind of practices lie as a writer and, and as an arts worker and as a manager of uh, such a, what I think is an incredible organisation, is that I always love to centre women of colour as writers' uh, voices first and foremost, and I think that's what this panel represents. Uh, but I also want to add that the social media uh, king for today is Mark Mariano, who's a Philippine ex-Australian writer. Thank you. Uh, 
from Blacktown, OG Blacktown, lives up the road, I reckon. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so I, I do understand we're kind of missing um, men of colour voices here on this panel, but rest assured Mark is here, and if you want to hear from Mark, uh, he'll be on a panel at the Sydney Writers Festival called Writing and Racism on Sunday, the 7th of May. So definitely check out the Sydney Writers Festival and Sweatshops events uh, to find out more. So my last question is, to all the writers of this panel who I come to know through Sweatshop, what is Sweatshop and how did you get involved? Evelyn, do you want to start us off? Um, so Sweatshop, I think, is um, like a really fantastic model of um, a kind of horizontal power structure. Um, so uh, when like people are empowered with space, to represent their own experiences and voices and and to grow their confidence with peers. I think that's actually like the best way of empowering new voices to emerge. So like my the thing that I like, you know, think is like the most, you know, if I can really think about Sweatshop as a model, um, is just that um the empowerment of both critique and of um, of sharing so like it's and it's like and I've taught creative writing and being creative writing workshop context and it's very different there because there's this competitive nature of like I just need you to stop talking so I can talk, talk about my work and it's a different <laughs> model when it's actually recognising a shared experience and a shared mission and goal unified by cultural context by social political um, uh, you know regional contexts I think that that changes the game completely so like yeah like for for me like you know special is that horizontal empowerment model of like there's no one who has the definitive answer of what what is you know like these questions of what makes good writing these are like exercises that, that can like motivate us to think about what we value and what's important to us but like yeah it's that strength of empowerment from a collective cross conversational structure that and, and sharing communal structure and i got involved with that through ellen van Nieven, who was involved i believe in early kind of stages of developing sweatshop back yeah, in like, like 2016 the, like 2016 or something like yeah, that yeah. and ellen um came to sydney and was just like oh you're from western sydney aren't you and i was just like yeah and, and they were like did you know about this thing i had no idea and, and came on and just get crushed it and it's great so yeah well, <laughs> that's the structure you know I mean, absolutely um and evelyn's poem um was published in the big black pink chapter two which i think was also republished to some degree in drop there and so there's a really nice mm -hmm. continuity there which was really special and i right. almost cried in the acknowledgements when i just saw that switch off <laughs> was thanked so thank you so much evelyn um joy how did you get started with Sweatshop and what was your interest in? What is Sweatshop? So my, one of the women I know who I met randomly at a Sydney Writers Festival, um, her name is Ellen, and she runs a book club called Bears Review. And she said to me, hey, there's a writers group that beats at Parramatta. Um, do you want to go? I was like, cool, yes, I'll go. Because um, I'd never, ever come across a writers group specifically for Western Sydney. All the writers group that I knew about were in Sydney, Sydney somewhere, and I was never there. So I went, but she couldn't go. <laughs> and I turned up to this, yeah, the, you know, it was at the University of Sydney at the time, um, the location is good, but I turned up to this room and there's a group of women, all women of colour, and we all just wanted to discuss the stories that we wanted to write. And I remember at some point in that first meeting, as we were going around the room introducing ourselves, I was just floored because it was the first time ever, aside from gatherings with my own family who were all Filipino, that I had ever been in a room that was completely women, completely women of colour. Everywhere else I'd been, you know, was, whether it was work, it was a different writers group, it was always, there was always, you know, white people there. And the conversation was somehow different. And I noticed at that first day that I couldn't put my finger on, on why, and as I continued to go and continued to, to workshop our stories, it was just, there was there is something about that collective experience and the support that comes from that group and also i think one thing that was quite interesting about the experience the we all had to remind each other constantly 
Your experience is valid. Your story is valid. Your story needs to be told. I feel like I never have to remind a white person that, but we always have to remind each other that. But it actually made for a really beautiful environment, and it's a it's a message that I continue to remind myself, that I continue to remind other creatives that I come across who are starting in their craft and they're sitting there thinking, do a piece of this good enough to share with the world? And what I love about the movement is that that is the message of the movement. It, it is, yes, your experience is that, yes, your story is worth telling. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Use your agency, which you have, to, to show the world that you exist. And I think that's what's, what I love about it. It's putting these voices and these stories forward that are often, I think we often self-select out. We, as a, as a writer myself, I just, I just told myself, okay, I can write it, but my story is not worth telling. It's not good enough to submit, or it's not good enough to be published. But here is this group of people who are like, Go for it. Just go for it. Because there is no there there is no bad story to be told in when it comes to people of colour. Yeah, our, our time our time is now, we deserve to be to have the spotlight. So yeah, absolutely. Um Sarah Lennon, how did you find out about Sweatshop from yeah. you know, <laughs> what's Sweatshop to you? Um, so I guess I found out through, well, uh, SBS, we had a partnership with, with Sweatshop and um, um, I, I really admire everything that they do. I, I guess I felt like, you know, I had to leave the West to succeed, you know, and that's so unfortunate. And so I feel like just to have an organisation which kind of counters that and says, you can bloom where you are planted, and so I'm reading Joe's, and uh, enjoys um, calligraphy, you know, you, you can, um, you don't need to leave to succeed, you know, you can be who you are and you can tell your stories and you can be exactly where you are is where you need to be. There's nothing that is, you know, wrong with you or there's nothing that is, that you're worthy and you're worthy of having your story told and you're worthy of telling them in the way that you want to and you don't have to self-censor. Um, and I think that was really a revelation for me who's, I've always been in my environment, you know, I've always had to like, you know, venture forth into, you know, um, outside of where I grew up, you know, in order to move forward. So I feel like that that, that, that new era in Western Sydney where those organisations are organic and they are grassroots and they exist within the West mm -hmm. and that those marginalised people actually own that space um, so they're not being kind of interfered with or, you know, the power structure is that people telling their own stories in their own way, in the way they want on their terms, mm -hmm. I think is very, very cool. So I applaud that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I saved Marion for last because Marion was at Sweatshop before I even joined. <laughs> and so, yeah, how did you find out about Sweatshop? What's Sweatshop to you? Well, look, um, Sweatshop made me as a writer, basically. You know, um, I really tried hard to look for a writer's group. I loved writing. I wanted to get better. Every writer's group I attended, you know, I just get told, oh, that was great. Thanks for reading. But I wanted something more. I, I really wanted to be serious about writing and to get better. So um, I was lucky enough to be introduced to Dr. Michael Muhammad Ahmed by um, my mentor um, while I was doing honours at Western Sydney University. And um, I found out that Muhammad ran this writers group. Um, it happened fortnightly um, for people of colour. It was a place where I felt safe, where I connected with others from similar backgrounds. But apart from that, um, they just taught me how to be a good writer. There was no, you know, um, wishy-washy pat on the back, good on you for writing this. I think one of the most important pieces of feedback I ever received that changed writing for me was when someone, I read this poem, and it was just, it was one of those angsty, almost teenage poems about a girl pining for some guy, you know, and I, I used all this, you know, beautiful, flowery language to describe it. And someone said to me that the poem was shit rolled in glitter. <laughs> and that image has stayed with me because I understood immediately what he was trying to say. That basically, you know, I had all the trappings of lovely poetry with the, you know, clever use of language and flowery metaphors and similes and whatnot. But what I was writing about wasn't making an original contribution to literature, wasn't really of interest to anyone, and really made me think seriously about what I write about and what makes good writing. So really, you know, Sweatshop put me through the crunch
punches, you know, to improve my writing. It taught me that writing is about editing, it's about being critical, it's about being able to take feedback, okay? So not taking things personally. When you get feedback, um, work with it to improve yourself. So it took me five years to write the hijab files. I workshopped most of it with Sweatshop. And yeah, you know, I'm really grateful um, to Muhammad, to everyone, part of Sweatshop, um, who's part of my journey as a writer. Yeah. So beautiful. All right, thank you so much um, for answering those questions. And so now we're gonna go to question time in the last 10 minutes. But before we go to that, I just wanna remind everybody that question time can often be a very vulnerable, scary position for writers. We don't know what you can ask. <laughs> we don't know if like, someone's gonna take their top off in the middle of it. We don't know anything. <laughs> and so, live stream to Facebook, so good to see Yes, let's do my own focus and then it's live stream, so if something happens, you know, it's there, not Facebook, forever. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's often a very vulnerable place. And so um, please be wary of that. And um, any questions you wanna ask, I think keep the writers and your interest in the writers first and foremost in your mind. Um, rather than asking, what can I do, or what about me? Um, make, make the questions a bit more open and a bit less um, focused on the, on the eye, I think, is, is what's most important. But then again, you can ask any question you want. Marcus Mariano is going around with the mic, and so, yeah, just put up your hand and we'll answer your questions. Does anyone have any? Yeah, Chris, go for it. Marcus.
and reading a book that had a place that I knew. Because the books I grew up with as an avid reader came from England. Yes, I am that old. Um, and to actually read, and I still remember that it was the eastern suburbs that they described. <laughs> it still was. And yeah. so now, as a reader and listening today, it was delightful to hear my town being talked about. So it's not just for women of colour, it is for every reader and for every reader now, but for every reader for the future. Thank you. Yeah. 100%. Actually, I remember one of the stories I wrote, um, I was, um, uh, so there was like ladies who worked in Big W, older Anglo ladies, who had to lie about where they lived at Postco yeah. to get a job as the city bank teller. Mm. You know, so so much about this is about class. Yes. Mm. You know, and it's about growing up and, and feeling like you had to lie about your postcode mm. to get a job in the city, you know? And so I think a lot of that is, is about power, you know, and um and and being working class, yep. you know, and they intersect. So yeah, I think um hundred percent West Bank represents. <laughs> and knowing Margaret since I was fifteen. <laughs> I did my work placement at Blacktown Arts at Tom Margaret it was just amazing at instilling in me a love of Blacktown, a love of literature, and what it means to collect literature for Blacktown, for the area that we live in. And so Margaret has just done an incredible job um, as, as um, instilling literature and reading and, and a safe space for readers and writers to come to in Blacktown. And so, you know, we're all doing our part, I think, and uh, Margaret is a perfect example for that. So if you get to talk to her, definitely talk to her <laughs> um, after today. Great, hello. Hello. Um, thank you very much, everybody. It was very inspiring um, hearing everybody's stories. Um, I'm also a writer, so I'm not going to ask anything um, too, um, too scary. Um, <laughs> but I just want to say, more like a provocation, just feel free to respond to it if you want to, or if not, that's fine too. Um, but recently I read somewhere where there's um, no such thing as a voiceless person, but there are people who are unheard. Mm -hmm. And just rubbed true, having listened to what you were really talking about today, there's a lot of talking to you about voiceless people. Well, they're not voiceless, they're just unheard. Yeah. Does anybody want to respond first? You just reminded me of the analogy I was going to use when you asked me what sweatshop was. It's <laughs> here's the analogy. But um, when you're at a wedding and the dance floor is, you know, happening, and there's a group in the middle and everyone's in that group, and you want to dance too, but no one's letting you in that circle. That's what it feels like to be a poor woman of colour in many, not just writing, <laughs> in anything actually, in lots of things. So it feels like to be a woman, it's what it feels like to be a creative, it's, it's what it feels like to be an outsider. And I think what's really important, and what I love about Sweatshop and many of the other literary movements is that it is creating a space, um, people like yourself you know, who, who are opening up doors in journalism and allowing a space for other writers and people of colour like Mark to participate and have a voice and feel confident in, in telling that story in mainstream media. Um, but I think definitely growing up, you just, you're, you're told that it's a nice story, but like, no one wants to hear that. No one, no, that doesn't matter that much. But it is so, so important for us to walk out of this room today and change that narrative and encourage people to speak up and give them, not just encourage them to speak up, but give them the space to speak up. And I think definitely one of the things I learned from you, Lindsay, is that sometimes that does mean for all the people who had this microphone the whole time to hand it over and step back and give someone, someone else the limelight. Um, but definitely I think as, as fellow creatives, um, I'm sure you, you might be in the audience and you might know somebody who you know, wants to, is, is trying to practice their craft. It might not be writing, it might be something else. Encourage them, buy their products, encourage, just keep encouraging them because that's what gives the unheard a voice. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And I think that provocation, I would like to hear from Evelyn, because, you know, we've, talk, we've talked about our intersections, but we're also settlers um, on unceded land, on land that was stolen. And so the, the unheard, or the, the forcibly unheard voices that I think we always need to listen to first is Aboriginal voices. And so Evelyn, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a really important provocation to place in there. And um, thank you, Winnie, also for bringing that back to the context of First Nations and sovereignty. Um, and I think, like, I want to I wanna shift up the language there just a little bit to recall that um, uh, there is a very agential process of silencing that has gone on um, that has gone on not just in this settler colonial, colonial context, um, but you know, and like many of the different communities that live in Blacktown are united by by global experiences of, of imperialism and colonialism, and then through that displacement and diaspora, and those are all political, economic processes, oh, and environmental processes, um, which require the silencing of you know, of, of the first peoples, of, of cultural, racial, ethnic minorities. Um, and um, we should be holding, we should be holding that history accountable to that active agential process of, of trying to silence voices, stories. Um, from a cultural perspective in Australia, um, Aboriginal people, like we know that our language has always been here, that it always will be, and that stories might not be able to be heard and accessed by everyone but they're still there and, and they are still felt and experienced and it's important that we allow ourselves to care for for those but one thing on that that i would like to emphasize is that um i think we do have a responsibility not just to like constantly be embracing new new voices um uh, new emerging voices you know, and when we talk about emerging, we need to also remember that emerging doesn't always mean young, um, and we need to have space for older people who've been, you know, trying to speak for a long time and who maybe didn't have the opportunities that have been created now. Um, but we do also, I think, really have a responsibility to go back into archives, to talk to older generations, to speak to information managers, people like librarians and such, to try to record and keep copies of stories of writing of the voices that were around, you know, decades ago, some of them hundreds of years ago, that don't get that place and don't get that space and platforming now. I think we owe, you know, we owe those who tried, some of whom unfortunately failed because those circumstances were just too divisive, too harmful, too volatile. Um, there was too much silencing and erasure. Um, we owe it to them to try to remember and to try to keep a place for those stories and for those voices and carry them with us as we do with the work of the future. Um, you know, that's a part of making space for those who will come to show how we've actually honoured those who have come before. And we do that in ancestral processes for you know, as Aboriginal people. But I think that that care for um, that that care for who come before us and who's who made the work we do now possible is actually a sentiment that's expressed and felt by a lot of other cultures, many of which are living today in, in the Blacktown area. So I reckon we need to, you know, we need to reverse that erasive process, that silencing by trying to go back and keep those records and keep those stories going. Can we just give a round of applause yeah. for Evelyn? but I'm sure a few of you have answered your hands as I might have. <laughs> um, so I just want to wrap it up quickly, but the writers will be around for like half an hour or so, so you're more than welcome to talk to us kind of one on one, if that's something you're interested in. Um, please, please, please have a look at the merch stand. Um, the prices are there for the books um, and also for uh, Joy's lovely artworks and you can buy them at the front counter, I think, just where they have a cost machine right there. Um, and so please, please, please join me in the arts and 
Center uh, without at least a token uh, to remember today. And if you're wanting to learn more about Sweatshop um, and our work and the work that Joy, Evelyn, Marian, and Sarah, and Mark um, have contributed to, um, you can find us at www.sweatshop.ws. Um, you can find, you can see all our publications, all our writers, um, and go from there. We're also at the Sydney Writers Festival um, at, the second, uh, at the first and second of May. We're launching our new book called Racism, Stories on Fear, Hate, and Bigotry. Pretty big one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, just ongoing. Um, it's never ending story, you know. Yeah. Um, and so if you're wanting to see kind of more of our collective and, and more of those stories, um, definitely do see us um, at the Sydney Rose Festival. I want to say thank you to Blackstown Art Centre, to Susan, uh, to Frank. I want to say thank you to Afghan Tea Corner for providing this lovely tea and cookies. So please have some before you leave. I also want to give a shout out to Hadith, who's been sitting over there. She's one of the other Blacktown writers, very um, And she's, she's been a great new contribution to Sweatshop. So thank you everybody for sitting, being so engaged. Um, and yeah, hope, hope to see you around Blacktown soon.